this is a talk I've done once or twice before, but I've um, added a few extra bits for, for this evening. And um, it's constantly under revision because there's always extra things that are worth putting in. Uh, that does mean it's getting longer and longer. So uh, you can always log out if, you're, uh, if you've had enough. <laughs> Um, anyway, what I want to do is to talk about Taylor's, uh, the, the history of the company and, uh, and, the, and the works and some of the work that they did in the early days. Um, the story goes up to about 1880, but uh, obviously I'll, I'll take the family story right up to the end in 1981. Um, for those of you who don't know me, as well as being, uh, as being a Bell writer and Bell historian, um, I'm also involved with the, the Taylor's at the moment as um, uh, the archivist in the Foundry Museum and Archives. And um, so the last eight years or so had, had a lot of um, access to the, the archives that, that hadn't had before. And it's been super to, uh, to have an opportunity to, to do the research. We're very keen for those archives to be used to whether they're for, it's for people who want to find out about their own bells uh, or who have broader studies. Um, so when things open up again, um, if there's anything you've seen that, that, that catches your eye and you'd like to know more about, then, um, then you know, it's perfectly possible. Anyway, the story begins in a Bedfordshire village called Risley. Um, the, the place where Robert Taylor, the founder of the company as we know it, was born, um, is now a pub, the Fox and Hands. And there's a picture of it in the 19, uh, 1930s. It was, um, it was still a pub up until lockdown, certainly, and um, had, a, had a beer there a few years ago. There's a couple of uh, Taylor memorials in there um, commemorating the connection with the village. Now, Robert Taylor um, was born in 1759, uh, local family, um, and um, apprenticed uh, to Edward Arnold of St. Neots in 1775. I'll say a little bit more about Arnold in a moment because he was a bell founder, he's part of the, part of the Taylor story. And uh, Robert ended up being left in charge at St. Neots when Arnold moved to Leicester in 1784. The first bells he cast in his own name are for an almost adjacent village to Risley, uh, a place called Bletso, a peel of five cast in 1786. Now the firm was at St Neots in those days um, until they moved to Oxford in 1820. And it was in Oxford that, uh, that Robert Taylor died. Uh, and there's his plaque, which used to be in uh, the church at St Ebbs, uh, which is the parish that the foundry was in. Um, St. Debs has gone a bit evangelical, the whole place has been uh, completely refurbed inside, uh, and I'm not sure the, um, the plaque has survived the, the transformation. The little sketch in the bottom left is supposed to be Robert Taylor. Um, some of the very early records at Loughborough have these little doodles in uh, of, of various members of the family, but none of them have names by them. Uh, Trevor Jennings, though, the, the, the historian of the firm, um, did think that he could, he'd worked out who is who, and he thought this was Robert. So there we are, Robert Taylor, his birthplace, and his burial in Oxford. Now, the origins of the company then are there with the Taylor family, uh, but the, the, uh, the, the links in bell founding history uh, go back considerably further. Um, you'll notice that on this uh, piece of late 19th century publicity, uh, this lovely engraving of the works as it was in about 1882, um, the firm very proudly are boasting their successors to the ancient firms of Watts, Eyre and Arnold of Leicester and St Neots. And the key name there is Watts. But we'll look first at, um, at, at the heirs. The story of continuous bell founding in, in what is now Taylor's goes really back to 1718, uh, when Thomas Eyre the first uh, cast a bell for the parish of Yeldon with his brother John. John dropped out of the business, I think he died actually, um, within a couple of years. Um, but Thomas Eyre went on to be a very successful bell founder and was followed by other members of his family. I think it all started when uh, Richard Sanders of Bromsgrove, a founder from this area, of course, went over to cast a new peal of bells for Kettering. There'd been a heavy five, and in 1714, they decided to install a new peal of eight. Uh, Sanders, for some reason, was chosen to cast them. Um, I wouldn't have thought he was the first choice of people who are good at casting bells of that size and, uh, and that number. Anyway, he got the job and um, I think Air must have been interested in it and decided he had a go. Uh, within a couple of years, Aaron actually had to recast two of the bells at, at Kettering himself, one of them the tenor and the seventh uh, just a few years later. Um, the bell at uh, El Eldon is rather interesting because it's got the, the initials of T and J Air on the, on the crown and that lovely um, uh, date, uh, date stamp on the waist. 
Thomas Eyre, though, was much more than just a bell founder. He was a clockmaker, architect, and a lot more besides. He was actually very well connected. Um, among his friends and, the, and the, 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 the sort of society that he was involved with was the famous William Stukeley, who's shown there. And uh, among the things that he did, he made this model of a bridge for a, a, a park in Northamptonshire. He was the designer, architect of Stoke Doyle Church, and he also cast the bells and made the clock. He's uh, a contender for having been the, the inventor of the Weybridge, um, instead of the old steel yards that uh, had to lift up an entire uh, wagon to weigh it. Uh, you, with, with Ayer's invention, you could just drive over, get a weight, and then drive on. And he was a map maker. Um, he did uh, several, he did a very early 1720s map of Northamptonshire and uh, illustrations and maps for the county's history, uh, John Bridges' history in Northamptonshire. So this man was more than just a bell founder, uh, a, a very talented man indeed. As far as bells were concerned, his circle extended to uh, influential clients like Squire Fortry in Leicestershire and the Reverend William Ludlam, who was a Cambridge mathematics professor in the 18th century and also later rector of St Mary de Castro in Leicester. These two Leicestershire churches are places where the heirs worked. Um, Thomas uh, cast a pill of six for um, Galby Church on the left in 1740. And um, in, 17, in the late 1750s and 60s, uh, cast a, a ring of eight uh, for Kings Norton Church, uh, just a mile down the road. Uh, Squire Fortry was a huge supporter of ringing um, uh, uh, very interested in ringing in Leicester, uh, gave the Leicester ringers encouragement and, uh, and bought them a set of handbells and so on. And uh, he had these two churches built in his village, villages and uh, got air to install the bells. He was a bell hanger. Uh, the frame at Manchester, which you can see in the middle, has a date 1751 on it, was made by Thomas Eyre and his, and his men. And in the parish records, there's the receipt dated 1752 in uh, Eyre's very distinctive writing. Uh, there's the Stoke Doyle clock and a bell at Stoneley, 1752, is quite a nice example of, uh, of his work. His brother, Joseph Eyre, moved off to St Neots, where he had a, a foundry from 1733 until he died in 1772. Joseph was a very different sort of character, but he was also involved in the same stuff, making weighing machines, clocks, machinery of various sorts, and he was quite a property speculator and developer. He built these assembly rooms in St. Neots in 1750, for example. His foundry was shown on that map of the 1760s, and uh, it was on the site of the Priory, right by the river, which is very convenient for transport. His biggest job was the casting of the 2700 8 for St. Neots Church in 1753. They'd been recast, but it was a big job um, in its time, a job of that size. And there's a complete ring of six at East Carlton um, in original uh, frame and fittings. Joseph Eyre, as I say, made um, clocks. There's a the clock at Swithland in Leicestershire is one of his, 1764. And at Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, uh, there's a chime barrel, a chime machine, signed there by J. Eyre St. Neots, 1761. And he made long case clocks too. Uh, this is one that used to belong to Ronald Clouston, uh, the well-known bell historian. So the key points about the heirs, really, really, are there were four main members of the family. Um, Thomas and John, brief partnership at the beginning. Then Thomas, uh, Joseph in parallel with him at St. Neots when Thomas was at Kettering. And Thomas II, who went bankrupt after a few years. He wasn't the success that, uh, that Thomas I had been. If you look at the distribution on the right, um, the bells are mainly in Northamptonshire, uh, less, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, Northamptonshire, um, Yes, Leicestershire, um, Huntingdonshire and Cambridgeshire, but the, their work did spread further, um, 10 in Warwickshire, for example, including Little Five at Homily, uh, which are one of Thomas uh, the first um, bell sets. Uh, the biggest job of all was probably the 1300 weight eight at Grantham, uh, Thomas Eyre of Kettering, 1752. So the bell foundry, if you like, got off to a good start. Well, in 1772, Joseph Eyre died Thomas Eyre, had, 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 the first had died and his son had gone bankrupt. So uh, the succession was through Joseph. And um, in 1772, Edward Arnold advertised in the papers that he was the successor to Joseph Eyre and was going to carry on with the several branches of bell founding, clock and watchmaking, 
and also makes weighing engines for carriages and performs all sorts of whitesmith's work at this shop at St. Neots aforesaid. Arnold then carried on. Um, and uh, Arnold has had a, a suffered a bad press. Uh, too many people still believe the stuff that the 19th century bell historians wrote. And J.J. And, uh, J. J. Raven, the author of the books on Cambridgeshire and Suffolk, said that Arnold knew nothing about bell, hang, bell founding and relied entirely on his foreman. Um, I think that's quite untrue. And, uh, and, and Arnold was actually an extremely competent founder who produced some very fine bells. Um, Kiso tenor in Bedfordshire is a, a really super bell. And the tenor at Hathen in Leicestershire is another um, good bells generally, those cast by the heirs and the um, and the uh, and Arnold. Now the Watts influence comes in here um, because the records that we have at Loughborough include these very old notebooks dating back to the the 18th century, pretty fragmentary, um, kept in in not not in very good order, all sorts of jottings on the page, but on the page I've, I'm showing you. Um, there's a note basically saying that Eyre and Arnold modelled their bells for Sawston and Fullbourne on 17th century bells that they actually went and measured and copied um, at various churches in Bedfordshire and Northamptonshire, Risley, Wilden and Norton. And if you look at the two bells on the right, um, look at just the shape of them. Those high crowns are very much a feature of, uh, of bells cast by the heirs and, and all, even by tailors right up into the 1880s. And you can see that the Curdworth air bell at the bottom is an almost exact mimic of the one by Watts at Leamington Hastings. So you've got the documentary side and the physical evidence of the bells to show that there was, um, the, the succession was maintained um, through that copying when they first got going. Watts was a particularly important founder um, and, and he, he deserves a, a, a word in passing. Um, they were casting large numbers of bells in the early 17th century, and some of them very, very good indeed. Uh, the lovely five at Naseby in Northamptonshire, for example, is, is a particularly good, good, uh, good one. And the Stratford and Avon Guild Chapel bell, um, 2800 weight, is a superb piece of craftsmanship. And with a little bit of gentle retuning by tailors in the 1990s, is a beautiful sounding bell as well. His biggest bell, the old tenor at St Margaret's Leicester, was sadly recast in, in 1921. Though, of course, what's there now is the tailor ring that's there now is super. Watts cast a lot of bells with the um, Jesus of Nazareth and so on inscription on, and uh, the old bell historians used to call them Watts Nazarene bells. Well, there is one at Leamington and its inscription. Now, Arnold, um, having worked at St Neots for um, 12 years, um, suddenly decamped and moved to Leicester. He is removed to and has erected a new bell foundry near the South Gates in Leicester. And uh, if you look at the, the yellow list, making clocks, turret, watches, uh, machines, weighing for, for weighing carriages and engines for extinguishing fire, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the bell foundry business only will be continued at St. Neart. So in other words, he moved his entire operation to Leicester, including the bell foundry, um, leaving St. Neart's as just being a foundry. There's Leicester, uh, where Arnold had uh, uh, cast a ring of eight in 1781, and they were later augmented to 10 in 1787. Arnold had previously cast a six for Quorn, and his first job when he got to Leicester was a, a 1285 for Rothley, which is still, still there. After 1786, Arnold moves on to do other, other stuff. He, he starts, um, and, and uh, in 1792, he opened the first iron foundry in, in Leicester. So he's an innovator, he's an entrepreneur, he's trying new areas of work, but still making his garden engines, weighing machines, electrical conductors, and so on. He's worth just taking his story to the end because he did carry on bell founding until 1798. And one of his last jobs was the six at Great Bar, um, 1796, five of which are still, still there. He, uh, he carried on with his range of uh, work like making mortars. Uh, there's an Arnold mortar on the left. It's in the Foundry Museum. Bell hanging, um, set of fittings there made by Arnold in 1795. But he did go bankrupt in 1793. His iron foundry failed. Uh, and he previously had a financial difficulties at St. Neots. He sort of disappears from the bell world in 1802 with a bell hanging job at St. Mary's Stamford. Um, but I found out quite recently that he moved to Tottenham and with his son carried on just making weighing machines until he died in 1831 at the ripe old age of 92. So there's a lot of technical ability behind uh, what eventually became Taylor's. So we come to Taylor's at last. 
Here are the first bells cast by tailors. Um, the Bledsoe bells of 1786, recently rehung by the present firm, um, were always thought to be the first, until about four years ago, a little bell turned up, dated 1785 and signed by Robert Taylor. Um, we were very quick to get hold of that for our museum, and it's now there as a, as a prize exhibit. Now, the Taylors ended up forming a dynasty that lasted for um, almost 200 years. Uh, it started by Robert Taylor and then his sons, William and John, uh, had followed him in partnership once they got to Oxford. Um, I'll show you some pictures of the members of the family in, in, in just a moment, but um, it continued through to the death of Paul Taylor in, in 1981. Here they are, John and William, the brothers, uh, were then succeeded in 1858 by John William I, um, who was a, a great innovator and uh, assisted in his later period by his sons, John William II, John William Jr, and Denny, Edmund Dennison. Then uh, the, the uh, Arnold Bradley and Price Taylor were the sons of John William II, uh, both died young. Um, Arnold was one of three members of the Taylor family killed in the war, and Price, who headed the firm um, after the war, um, died on a business trip to Canada in 1927. Paul Taylor was the son of John William II by his second marriage and was really very young compared to the rest of the family. Um, and he took over um, after Denny died in 1947 and remained at the head of the business until he died in 1981. So the foundry had several locations. Um, there at St. Nears until 1820, and there were two sites there. Um, then they moved to Oxford uh, from 1821 to 1854. But the, the thing I sh shan't be saying much about tonight, but just need, needs a mention, is the venture down to Buckland Brewer in Devon from 1825 to 1834. Um, Taylor spotted, John Taylor this is, spotted a gap in the market down there because a lot of the older foundries had, had, had come to an end, uh, the Penningtons and the Bilbies. And um, he picked up a lot of work in, in Devon and, and Cornwall during that period. And then from 1840 in Loughborough, where again, they've had two sites. The records include more sketch plans and there are, little, there are details of all the, um, the furnaces. Um, two in St. Neats, the one on the Priory site where there was that conical building. And then briefly in Cambridge Street, St. Neats before, um, before they moved to Oxford. The Cambridge, premise, the Cambridge Street premises are supposed to have been destroyed by fire, um, but I've never seen any definite evidence of that. There's Buckland Brewer, and the first foundry in Loughborough was in Packhorse Lane in Southfields. And um, you can see it there with Southfields uh, as on, along that side, along the top side of the, uh, of the drawing. Just briefly on Robert Taylor, um, he was in St. Neots. Um, the surviving records include quite a lot of stuff from his time. And uh, he cast one bell for, um, for his own native village of Risley, uh, the one that's at the top there. The main peals of bells that he cast are listed there, and uh, they're all fives and sixes. He didn't actually uh, cast a, a ring of eight. Then when they moved to Oxford, uh, William and John joined the firm formally, and uh, you'll notice from the advertisement, they're describing themselves as bell founders, church clock and chime makers in St. Ebbs at Oxford. And they've opened a shop for the purpose of carrying out the above business, together with all kinds of fancy and Smith's work, church and house bell hanging and so on. And they, like Arnold, they're doing weighing machines for roads, fire engines, lathes, cutting engines, smoke jacks and so on, repaired and made. So still a very general engineering business, uh, but specializing in bells and clocks. This is a list of the bells that they'd cast in, uh, in about the 10 year period from 1826 to 1836. Um, actually it's a bit earlier than that because the West Bromwich ones are 1832, I think. And uh, John was always an enterprising um, man. He was always looking for new markets. And for example, cast a new pillar bells at Stoke-on-Trent, broadening the range of, um, of activity of the, of the firm and going where the work was. William uh, was a slightly eccentric character, but he was a very, very talented clockmaker. Um, there's one of his clocks there at uh, Whiton, just down the outside, skirts of Oxford. The bell hanging work the firm did um, went through various improvements during the course of the century. Um, until their bells were rehung in the early, uh, around 2000, um, Swaff and Bulbeck in Cambridge had a complete installation 
of tailors, about 1820, uh, very competent hangings. The, um, the firm from Ayers Day onwards had used what we call hoop gudgeons or continuous gudgeons. Uh, that's a slightly unprepossessing photograph sitting on the back boxes waiting for uh, transportation, but it does actually show you how these gudgeons work. They're made in a single piece with a hoop uh, round the cannons in the, in the middle. And it means that they can be kept in very, very, they can be made to, to perfect alignment and then kept in alignment very easily. They were quite early in starting to experiment with iron frames, uh, like this one at a one bell tower in Warwickshire. And those fittings are very recognizably tailors of the 1830s and, and 40s and 50s. Um, very typical iron work and it's got hoop gudgeons on. And notice that rather strange roller rather than a ground pulley um, fixed to the frame. In the 1850s, tailors did a lot more experimenting with iron frames, um, and I, but I haven't got any slides of those tonight. Little things where they're innovating, crown staples. Uh, the traditional crown staple involves a cast staple and a separate attachment method. Well, tailors started experimenting with, uh, with alternatives. At the top at Wilmington in 1814, um, there are two, two prods come out from the crown and they've got bushes in them and uh, a, a, almost a modern clapper top um, with, a, with a round top and a bolt through. The, uh, the two ones below show a square section staple um, with plates bolted to the side and the plates have bronze bushes in so that the T-headed clapper rotates in them. Uh, very rigid. Um, it's fine if you've got the clappering right. If it's odd struck, almost impossible to sort out. They, um, they also did a lot of work um, with, with decorative features. Um, they improved the, the standard of inscription design and they played around with cannon types. Um, the cannons on top of the bells uh, had been ornamented at various stages through history, and the heirs used to produce bells with, uh, with finely molded cannons. But um, Taylor went to, uh, John Taylor at Loughborough went to a new level, uh, producing these cannons with, uh, with winged heads and faces on. And the ones at Kingsbury were cut off by Gordon Lane when the bells were recast and made into the Belfry table. So if anyone's been to Kingsbury, you may, you may recognize those. At Oxford, William was more or less on his own from 1840 because John, John settled in Loughborough. Uh, but he too was, was improving the decoration. Uh, just look at those lovely dolphins on the, uh, below the inscription on that bell of 1843. That's um, a family crest also found on stained glass windows in the church, but uh, William very ably put them on the bell uh, and, and arranged them very nicely. So we start to come to tailors in or near Birmingham. Uh, the firm didn't really get to, get close to the to our area until 1829, when they cast two trebles for Sedgley. These lists just indicate that it just just lists some of the main uh, the main bells they cast, not all of them. Um, but you'll notice the ring of eight at Penkridge, which were brought up by Canal, were um, quite a major ring, and the original eight at Coesley. Um, of 1847 uh, were also an early tailoring in the area. Um, in the Warwickshire list, you'll find there are several churches in Birmingham, the original bell at Bishop Riders, the original bell at St Chad's, uh, and the existing bells at Dudston uh, and Ladywood. The Kingsbury Peel of Five was the first, uh, first ring in the area, and Perry Bar um, comes in 1868. Um, the first bell of, by tailors in Worcestershire is, uh, is 1845 at Alve Church, and quite a lot more before the, the cathedral ring. Um, but the, the point about the cathedral ring is that that was such a prestige job, it led to a real flood of orders, and from 1868 onwards, um, tailors cast at several peals of bells for Worcestershire, um, specifically stemming from, uh, from that, that major commission. Now, let's look at the business landscape in 1835. I'm not sure it's generally realised, but Whitechapel had, uh, if not a near monopoly, uh, certainly the lion's share of the market by 1840. They themselves had bought up several of the existing founders, John Bryant of Hartford, William Dobson of Downham Market, James Wells of Aldbourne, um, and the Ruddles of Gloucester. Um, they really were a big firm in 1835 after John, after John Ruddle died. So they 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 got big by amalgamation. They got a big um, a, a big output themselves, and the figures um, tell us that, that that we can't put too much reliance on these figures. But they're certainly well more than indicative. Indicative, 
Um, Mayors had really got the best part of 80% of the market by 1840, partly because all these other firms had gone out of business, partly because the other, uh, there weren't many others around, and tailors had only got perhaps 13% of the market. Um, things were very much to change uh, for, the, for the reasons that are in these four little pictures at the bottom. First of all, the church restoration movement, uh, the Oxford movement, and all the work that that brought in terms of uh, putting bells in order as well as buildings. The buildings, building of new churches throughout the 19th century. The process started big time in in, uh, in the 1810s, Waterloo churches, but um, the uh, it really, of course, went on through the, the 1850s, 60s, 70s. And that's Salter Street, in case anyone wants to wants to know. Uh, then came the Belfry re Reform Movement and uh, a real uh, boot up for for change ringing, which uh, um, got got a big uplift. And also the market for bells for public buildings. Um, so those things together meant that the, the demand for bells grew considerably. If any of you saw my talk on Saturday, then this is the, I'm afraid you're going to get some repeat slides here. But Taylor's uh, moved to Loughborough in 1839 uh, to cast the bells for the parish church. They moved initially to the Southfields foundry, um, and you can see the relationship between where Southfields, the main town centre and the parish church are and uh, then to the present Bell Foundry um, nearly 20 years later. This was John Taylor, uh, who by this stage was uh, self-styling himself the master of my art. You can see the quality of the work, uh, that coronation bell, which we nearly bought for the Taylor Museum, uh, except we did buy it, except when they went to fetch it, the, the vendors couldn't find it. So uh, I'm afraid it's that slipped through our fingers. Anyway, this is Taylor's coming to Loughborough and the, really the start of the, the modern firm. It started with new bells for all saints, and uh, one of the conditions of the contract was the, the bells should be cast in or near Loughborough. So John, seeing his opportunity, uh, rented a warehouse formerly occupied by Pickford and Company, the carrier's depot, and, uh, and converted into a temporary foundry, and he was to stay there for the next, um, next 18 years. The reasons for moving to Loughborough uh, were spelt out in this uh, advertisement of 1840 encouraged by additional favours from the Midlands, in other words, you're seeing new markets in the Midlands, he's established a foundry at Loughborough. Uh, and one of its advantages was that from there, there was water and railway communication to almost every part of England. So he started with a 2400 weight eight for Loughborough, um, but quickly managed to grow the business. Um, a couple of years later, he cast a 10 for Newark, uh, same bells that are there now. Um, and uh, quite a fine ten they are, even though they're, they're, they're rather difficult to ring. Um, another big job that came along was the Royal Exchange, uh, replacing a Mears Peel of the 1840s in 1852. Not ringing bells, of course, but a big chime, 3,500 bass bell and 15 bells. Lots of village peels like Congestin in West Leicestershire. And in Dunham Massey, um, the, uh, the, 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 the 2,700 weight 10 plus 16 chime bells. They also, of course, when it went like everybody else to the, the, the big exhibitions of the time. Uh, they exhibited the great exhibition, but were really peeved to be beaten for the main prize by Murphy of Dublin. Uh, they, John, uh, John Taylor was very peeved by that. Anyway, um, John William Taylor Senior took over in 1858 on the death of his father. Um, the plans for this must have been on, on, on the stocks before um, daddy died. Um, but in 1859, the new foundry was built. There's the date still on the back, JWT, his initials, uh, 1859. And uh, gradually the complex grew um, from the foundry on the main site in that rectangular site. Um, other buildings grew alongside, the main one being the foundry and casting hall across the road in 1875. And on site, Taylor also built a house himself designed by the architect Charles Hanson and built in 18, um, 1866-7. Little things fall out of the, the archives sometimes, and the other day I discovered the bill for carpets for, um, for, for the house, which was rather fun because uh, at one stage I used to work for the Carpet Museum in Kidderminster, and um, they, the, the people there were quite, uh, quite excited by the find. So this is the, the, the foundry in the cherry orchard. Um, brand new purpose-built premises, uh, and in full production by 1860, when the first bells were cast in the, in the new foundry, which was at the back of the, um, of the open courtyard. 
you can see some bells there in the yard. The first bells cast there were for, for Hume in Manchester, a, a lost peal of eight. Um, eight, cast in 1860, May. At this point, if this was a film, the music would change to something much more sombre. He's not the villain coming on board, but Grimthorpe certainly changed the course of Taylor's history. All the bell founders in the 19th century had to keep on the right side of Grimthorpe. Um, he was uh, the self-appointed but undoubted expert on, uh, on clocks, and his um, treatise on clocks, watches and bells ran to 12 editions and sold huge numbers of copies. He was a lawyer, a Cambridge man. Um, he did ring, um, I think he was a tenor, tenor basher, um, but he was hugely influential in, in bell design and um, changed the course of what tailors were doing. Uh, they relied on him for patronage and a lot of jobs went their way through him. Uh, Warners were also in favor with Grimthorpe um, and of course cast, cast, um, cast the clock bells for Big Ben, but, uh, but lost out on the job for recasting it after Grimthorpe broke it. And, um, but Grimthorpe uh, was a real bully. Uh, he, he ran all of the people he supported uh, to a very tight budget, um, refusing to pay for a few pounds of extra metal over his specification at Croydon, for example. Interestingly, Taylor's uh, fawning at the feet of Lord Grimthorpe uh, named his son uh, Dennis, Edmund Beckett, Dennis, Edmund Dennison Taylor. Now, this was the period of technological advances. The, the Grimthorpe's um, ideas hijacked what the foundry were doing. They'd actually been up to some quite interesting things tonally with their bells in the 1850s, uh, but it all changed when, uh, when they had to start casting thicker bells to the, the specification that Grimthorpe required. One of the very big jobs was the, the original 12 and the board, the 90 hundredweight board in Worcester, cast in 1868-1869, first rung in 1870. And uh, they learnt a lot on that job um, that enabled them later to go for an even bigger job at Manchester Town Hall, um, where the great, great hour bell was originally six and a half tonnes, recast as eight tonnes a couple of years later, 20 bells in a chime, and a ring of 10 with a 5200 weight tenor. 32 tons of bells in that tower and, uh, and uh, mechanical chimes that, uh, that were really state of the art. The other great prestigious commission, of course, was St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, the 12 that we, we know and love now, 1878. And uh, a couple of years later, Great Paul, um, the, the, the biggest bell in a church in, in the UK to this day. Though of course it's been eclipsed now by the Olympic bell, uh, all 12 times it's been heard or whatever it was. There were of course competitors, um, Whitechapel was still there and still strong throughout the century, though they, they, they went down in their output from um, at, the, at the peak of the 1840s, uh, gradually through the period. Warners hadn't really cast any bells uh, apart from a few at the turn of the 18th century until 1850. And they joined, they joined the bell founding scene and hit it big time. By the 1880s, they, they I think, were in second place to Taylor's, both in, in huge numbers of bells being cast per year uh, for their output. There were smaller firms, including the Birmingham firms, Blues, Barwell and Carr, and Gillett and Band of, of Croydon started bell founding in 1878. They had been Taylor customers, uh, but set up their own foundry using some of Warner's men who they poached in 1878. But the point is that by 1882, this is their, their catalogue of that date, Taylor's are very much an established firm, um, commercially successful, and with, uh, with some really big prestige jobs to their name. <clears throat> then came disaster. On 23rd of June, 1891, uh, a big part of the works was destroyed by fire. Um, the works were damaged in, in various parts, uh, not the foundry itself, but the, the engineering workshops and so on. The, the, uh, the, 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 cover, the open yard had recently been covered in and that was uh, the, the, the roof was destroyed. The tower on the left on the right hand picture was a, a demonstration tower for, for clock chime bells. Um, that, that too was new and uh, wasn't rebuilt really after the fire. The little tower on the front also used to house chime, uh, uh, chime bells and that wasn't rebuilt really uh, either. So the, the rebuilding did create new opportunities. They, they brought in a new crane system. Uh, they got rid of those two towers uh, because they got something better in mind and uh, re-equipped. 
And the reconstruction period was one of, uh, of great innovation and improvement. Uh, John William I still at the helm, but with um, John William Jr. and Denny uh, very much in tail. The 1890s saw huge improvements in frames and fittings, in tuning, in bell design, in bells as objects of art. Um, Taylor's bells of the 1870s and 80s have been pretty awful, artless looking things. Uh, and also the move into the, into the world of carillons. I'll take you through those, uh, those briefly. First of all, bell hanging and frames and fittings. Um, Taylor started developing new forms of cast iron frame in the early 1880s. Warners were doing new cast iron frames as well at this time. Um, Taylor started with their cast iron high A frames, like the old frame at um, Malvern Priory, you can see on the bottom left. They also made composite frames with cast iron struts uh, and wooden, wooden, wooden heads and sills, and then moved into all, all iron frames. <clears throat> The A-frame was short-lived and by um, 1889 onwards, they, they started producing cast iron H-frames and um, low side frames came along from 1892. The very earliest ones were made of um, interlocking castings, um, very expensive, very robust, um, but costly to make and, and not really economic when competing with uh, other firms who were making cheaper, cheaper goods. Uh, so the designs were modified shortly afterwards using more steel and not, not, not just of cast iron. And um, really in the 80, early 1890s, the, the standard Taylor designs evolved. Um, cast iron frames of the sorts we see and cast iron headstocks from 1893 onwards. The Hastings stay was not invented by Taylor's, it was invented by the Reverend Edward Hastings Horn, um, but um, came in in 1894. Um, brilliant engineering and uh, reducing friction on the uh, old stiders that tended to get caked in oil and, and therefore um, jammed up. And um, Sir Arthur Haywood, the first president of the Central Council, uh, gave them an improved bearing design with uh, Haywood lubricators. And those plain bearings uh, were, were marvellous. They ran and ran and ran for, for decades. Taylors at this stage were doing a number of research and development trips on the continent. Um, John W. Taylor Sr. was in, uh, in France in June 1895 and we have his journals and, and inspection notebooks of the things he saw. Um, Junior was at uh, Mechlin, Moline in 1897, uh, looking at Carolyn's. They were pursuing ideas for various sorts of business development and product improvement, um, tuning to some extent, because they were trying to re re reinvent uh, um, harmonic tuning, but they were also very interested in the decoration of bells on the continent. And they liked the idea of producing Carolyn's, um, which was something that was, uh, difficult for them with their existing knowledge of tuning. Tuning came first and Canon Simpson published these papers on why bells stand out of tune and how to cure them. Uh, but of course he was only a theorist. Um, he, he certainly got the ideas right, um, but it fell to Taylor's to actually develop them into commercial production. Uh, Taylor's invested heavily in, uh, in equipment, um, getting themselves a, a vertical boring lathes capable of dealing with bells up to several tons. Um, there's JWT Senior uh, looking absolutely tiny alongside the, uh, the big bell for Downside Abbey or Beverly. Um, and uh, also in tuning forks, they got the, the latest state-of-the-art tuning forks very accurately tuned. And that enabled them to, uh, to, to cast and, uh, and make bells that were in tune with each other, but also in tune with themselves, with their, their internal harmonics um, in tune with each other. And this perfection of tuning uh, was to help them to break into uh, new markets and, and improved products. They also were keen to improve bell design and decoration. Um, the standard increased generally at this time, uh, but these are some of the best examples. They, they started using bells cast in the lost wax molding process. Uh, one of them, their experimental bell on the right, on the left, um, is now in the Taylor Museum at Loughborough. Um, but it was an experimental bell and it was just sold on to a Roman Catholic school in Kendall in 1898. It wasn't cast especially for that job. Um, but their biggest job um, at the Lost Wax Bells was Loughborough Parish Church, where the bells actually went through three um, re-castings re re in the space of 50 years. And the last one, the present bells of 1899, are really beautiful looking bells, as well as being the demonstration peel 
for or for Simpson tuning, true harmonic tuning. In terms of carolins, um, Taylor's had always cast chimes. The Royal Exchange in 1852, I've already mentioned. Uh, there was a chime of 1884 at Aberley Clock Tower um, in Worcestershire. Um, 20 bells, the largest of, uh, of four tons. But the Taylors have always been acutely aware of the difficulties of getting the, the notes of the smaller bells right. Even casting the bill of 12 for Worcester, uh, you know, Taylor was adamant he would not cast a, 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 small, a treble above a certain note uh, because they just couldn't, get the, couldn't, couldn't control the notes properly. There were a couple of Belgian carolins in the UK by this stage, um, both cast by the Van Ayrshots of Louvain. Um, Aberdeen Cathedral, St. Nicholas on the left, and uh, Eaton Hall in Cheshire on the right. Um, the Eaton Hall Carolyn remains, um, the, the Aberdeen one's been replaced, but both were considered pretty unsatisfactory. Taylors felt that if they got the tuning right, they could do better. Here, this photograph on the bottom shows that one of the, it's just a bell family shot really, but those bells happen to be um, a set of 10 cast for Ames in Iowa in the States. And they were one of Taylor's first true harmonic chimes in 1899. And they're now part of a full carillon. That really was the beginning of Taylor's move into the carillon market. Um, two things happened in the early 20th century. First of all, they installed uh, a carillon at the works. Uh, there's the, there are the plans for the, the foundry carillon tower. Um, Barracliffe and Allcock, the architects, 1905. And uh, 25 bells were installed in, in, in 1906 later enlarged. Uh, celebrity recitals took place there, including um, one by the, the noted Belgian carolinaire, uh, Joseph Denin uh, in 1912 and 1913. But also, of course, in Birmingham, the Bourneville carolin, the original Taylor instrument was, was installed in 1906, uh, just two octaves, but later enlarged. Come the First World War, and uh, like all, uh, um, industries of the sort, Taylor's had to convert to munitions work. Um, on the left there you've got John William Taylor III with a, with a, a, a load of shell cases. Uh, sadly um, he was to return to the front uh, just a few weeks after that photograph was taken I think and, uh, and killed, killed, in, uh, killed at the front. It saw the, uh, the arrival of women munitions workers at the foundry of course and if you look at the day book and the sales through the wartime period some bills were cast, but most of the work going out of the, of the doors was munitions. After the war, um, Taylor's cast the Carolyn in the park at Loughborough, uh, and the, 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 the 8200 weight base bell of the Carolyn was given as a family memorial. There's the inscription in memory of uh, the nephews of Denny Taylor, uh, who, who lost their lives in the war. The three of the sons of John William Taylor, Jr. Sad story, sad loss, and of course it did uh, affect the, the foundry and the continuity of the business. The family story ends with Paul Lee Taylor, um, a musician uh, and someone who was always happy to explain the, the craft to, to others. Uh, lots of photos of him de uh, demonstrating uh, things at the foundry and show, showing people and explaining the process to the work, to, to, to visitors. And there he is doing a television broadcast and other people's jobs with Phil Drabble in 1956. In terms of uh, what, the, what it meant for the family, uh, well, the, 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 they were a, a respectable middle-class family, uh, reasonably comfortably off. Um, they had a nice house on the site of the foundry, built in 1865, and the Taylors lived there and from, the, from then until, um, uh, until Paul had to move out in, about 19, in the late 1960s. Um, John William Jr. moved in in 1885 as he took more and more of a share in the, in the management of the firm and his dad moved out to Shelthorpe House on the edge of Loughborough uh, down towards the cemetery uh, which had extensive grounds. Uh, John uh, William Sr. Was, was also into farming and, and other things and uh, had his uh, paddock out there and his horses. Denny uh, moved into a lovely arts and crafts house in Burton Walks near the grammar school in 1906 and uh, so you can see that they, they were living in big houses. They were uh, sort of um, nudging shoulders with the, 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 the leading industrialists of the town. The 1891 census shows them as having three household servants. There were unmarried sons and a daughter living at home. And their occupations were in banking, farming and the law, uh, as well as the foundry. So wealth and status, they did, they did quite nicely for themselves. Um, 
and uh, Denny certainly uh, died worth several million in today's money. Um, the others much less, uh, much less comfortably off. Uh, they were very keen on their cars and John Williams Jr. on his photography. Their, uh, photography. There are three church photographs taken by uh, J.W. Jr. around 1910. In the works there at the top, you've got um, one of the cars uh, actually in the, in the workshop, uh, full, of, uh, full of family having it shown off to them. And at the bottom right is the garage behind um, Denny's, uh, Denny's house at Buckland Walks, built especially for his Rolls Royce in 1906. Uh, a beautiful um, arts and crafts building, uh, really quite distinguished, and it's listed. They were very cl closely connected with Loughborough Parish Church and, of course, did a great deal for the Bells. Uh, improvements largely funded by the Taylors in 1887 when they made them 10 and recast the two tenors, and 1899 when the whole pill was recast again. The family memorials in the back of the church include the screen in memory of Price Taylor and the, uh, the ringer's corner at the base of the tower. And of course, all this was only possible through the workforce. And um, the interesting thing about the workforce is there were many people with long service and several generations of the same family work for the firm. Um, so it was a, you, you get, I think, the, the idea of the, the firm and how it worked and what the ethos was. In the archives, we've got some wonderful photographs of the, of the works as it was about 100 years ago. Uh, the foundry itself, top left. Uh, and the main hall, uh, there it is in 1913, um, with, with the cranes, with the, the, the glass roof covering. Lots of bells in and out. At the top uh, centre, you've got the drawing office, uh, top lit, uh, so designed for the job. Uh, on the right-hand side, you've got the tuning office, tu uh, sorry, the tuning shop, and a, and a bell on the machine. And uh, at the bottom right, Denny, Denny himself. <coughs> <coughs> Denny himself at his desk with family portraits behind. And the, the works on the outside with the foundry tower. Can't not mention the tower because of course it's the place after Birmingham Cathedral where most peals have been rung. Uh, much, much fewer peals these days, of course, um, but um, still the, the, the overall total there is enormous. Uh, most members of the Taylor family were ringers. Um, John W. Uh, Senior was a ringer and rang a peal of Grand Sir Tribbles at the age of 16, uh, the first peal on the bells at Loughborough, and uh, rang several peals right up into the 1880s and 90s. John W. Junior uh, saw the, uh, the advantages of being involved with ringers and joined um, F.E. Robinson's touring band and was well connected with ringers up and down the country. Um, in 1894, he conducted and rang the tenor to an 8,800 of superlative uh, on the back eight at the parish church, 2,808 tenor. So it's quite a mean ringer. Um, later on, Price Taylor, the one who died in 1927, uh, had rung a peal of Cambridge Maximus. And of course, peals of Cambridge Maximus were still quite rare in the 20s. So again, an able, an able ringer and involved with ringers. The, um, the building of the tower was, uh, happened after the restoration of the, the buildings after the fire, and the bells were installed in 1899. And of course, they had a foundry band, uh, pictures at the bottom with um, JW Senior, sorry, JW Junior, and Denny um, among the ringers on the ropes. So there we have it the Victorian works, um, shown here in a plan in the foundry catalogue of 1910. Um, the basic layout of the works is, is recognisable today, the foundry, the erecting shop and so on, tuning room. Uh, some of the peripheral buildings are now gone because the site around the foundry was redeveloped for social housing uh, around 1970. And that's when Bell Foundry House was, uh, was demolished, compulsory purchased and demolished. So there you have it. Uh, and uh, I, I, I end by just mentioning, of course, the news that I'm, I'm sure most of you know is that the Loughborough Bell Foundry Trust, who now own the property, uh, the, the premises and, and rent it to the foundry, um, have secured a major lottery grant for the restor further restoration of the buildings and to develop the museum. And, uh, but they do need to secure a quite a lot of matching funding uh, in order to meet the total cost. Um, so if anyone would like to contribute, um, just go to the website of the, of the Foundry Trust, uh, loughboroughbellfoundry.org, not hard to remember, and uh, there's an easy way to donate from, from there. 
if you want to come and visit us when we're open again, um, then the museum uh, will be open on a much more regular basis when, uh, when, when things start up again. And of course, there are works tours on casting days, which are very much enjoyed and, and uh, uh, worth doing. There are histories of the foundry. Trevor Jennings' uh, excellent history uh, is, uh, is currently out of print, but we are planning to reprint it. We've got a, a, a project lined up to, with students at Loughborough University um, who are working in the print and design um, uh, department. And uh, we're gonna do a joint venture that benefited them and helped us. Um, that again is on hold at the moment. Anyway, there you are. I hope that's given you an indication of, uh, of the interest of Taylor's history and where the firm came from and how it's developed. So with that, I'll end. Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us a really fascinating, I think, breadth of Taylor's, but also depth, you know, and that's, uh, you know, that's really, really impressive to do in, in a talk, to give that sort of breadth and depth. Um, we'll do a proper thank you uh, later, but um, I'm going to make you do a little bit more work first of all, uh, if that's all right. Um, so I just want to encourage uh, people, if they do have any questions, um, either to type them into the chat box or to raise, raise your hand. Um, we've got a couple of quite specific questions, but before we come to those, um, to pick your brains on those, uh, Chris, I just wondered why, why you thought Taylor's had been so successful, particularly in the 1800s. What do you think stand, you know, stood out really about Taylor's that made them so successful? Um, I don't know, I think the business ethos, and, and they, they, they were always uh, driven towards improvement. Uh, they were always trying to improve the products, and some of their, some of their experiments weren't that successful, um, but they were always, uh, you know, and, and very conscientious. Um, reading the letter books and the correspondence, I, I recently transcribed all the, uh, the, the correspondence about the Worcester Cathedral job, and, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the efforts they went to, 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 to try and please the customer and work with the customer and find their way through difficult difficult things. I'm sure that's one of the reasons that, that, that helped them um, secure business and hold business. Um, and of course they, they did become a big, a big name um, uh, as a result of some of the, the commissions they landed. Um, but they, they saw, I think, that there was a, there was a demand that, other, that the others were slower to see. And when they'd actually developed uh, true harmonic tuning, uh, they were really, really um, quick off the market, exploiting that market. I mean, their, their tuning secret was kept so secret. You know, you did not get to go into the tuning shop and the office behind. Uh, well into actually the, the 30s and 40s, even though by then the basics of modern tuning were, were understood more broadly. Um, so they, they were canny, I think is, is probably why, uh, why they did so well. Super, thank you. So I say a couple of quite specific questions coming in and we'll, um, We'll pick your brains on them, and uh, you know if, if if they're too specific, we can come back to them uh, perhaps later. Uh, Jonathan asks, were the Perry barbells replaced by those from Bishop Latimer? I think that was yeah. something earlier on your talk. Yeah, I mean the, the Perry barbells. Uh, one of the things that, that needs saying is that actually, of course, the nineteenth-century work of most founders is pretty unfashionable, and has been since um, since the, the discovery of true harmonic tuning. So therefore, peals Victorian peals of bells haven't had a, haven't lasted very well. And um, when the opportunity came up to um, uh, to to um, you know replace them, uh, yes, of course they did it. Just as just as many of the other Victorian peels in the city have gone, you know, St Chad's, um, Erdington, um, just a, just and and also Selly Oak, you know. So so that none of them have really survived. But uh, but Perry Bar were replaced by uh, the long story of uh, Derrick End, um, Latimer's, and then Perry Bar. I've uh, seen a couple on the on the thing, and I, I'll just pick them up. Actually, uh, Michael Williams has asked about um, whether Paul Taylor's death affected the, the, the firm. Um, the short answer is that Paul had a son who he hoped would have taken over the business, but sadly he died quite young as a teenager. And Paul sort of slightly lost heart in the, in, in it all after that because he was hoping to hand on to a successor, and uh, he was he was longing to retire and 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 was sort of only peripherally in the business for the last few years, but, but was still there. There was a, a slightly unfortunate um, arrangement that Denny made when he died, because uh, his will was incredibly complicated and uh, left, the, left the whole thing in, in, he left a lot of money and a lot of property, but it was all tied up in, in, in the business in a very complicated way. And I think if he'd been able to, Paul would have actually extricated himself sooner than, than, than he did. He did. He did retire, but not, not totally. Um, and by then the market was, they'd been struggling, I think, for a few years before that as well. 
so it was a tricky time, uh, but really the um, ball was sort of um, uh, still there, but but it, it wasn't sort of completely led by him with a positive looking future by the time he'd gone. It, it was already struggling. Super. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Dave, uh, David Large uh, is pleased to hear about your kind words about Arnold. Uh, we ring at Great Bar, the remaining of five, plus the tenant that was recast by Cara Smedic in the 1920s following an incident with the clock hammer. Our Arnold Bells from 1796 are fine. We're accustomed to hearing Arnold Bells being maligned. Uh, and as somebody also rings at Great Bar, you know, I, uh, I endorse the, the fine, the fineness of the, the Arnold Bells. So, uh, uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, someone, someone said, um, uh, I think someone, I saw half a question about, uh, about the connection between Ayers and Ray Ayers, I yeah. think. Um, I could only read half of it, but I think that was what was coming. Yeah, the question um, is: is Ray, there... Ray did claim descent back to the back to the heirs of, of St. Nears, but I don't think it was um, completely direct. Uh, but that was one of the things that got him into it. I, I knew Ray when he was a metallurgy student at Leicester University back in the early seventies, and before he got into into bells properly, his dad used to keep the co-op around the corner from where I lived. You know, he was the store manager. And um, Ray, Ray and I actually got out on, on lots of expeditions looking at bells around that time. And, and it was his family history that got him into the whole, the whole bell thing. And he was uh, largely responsible for restoring the bells at Kings Norton in the, in the mid-70s. Um, so, yes, I think the short answer is, if, if I read the question right, yes, the short answer is yes, there is a family connection, uh, even though the spelling's different. Super. That, that was the question, yeah. <laughs> um, question, actually, Simon has this... <laughs> okay, normal service resumed. <laughs> yeah, that's the right number. Um, Simon asked a question that actually was on the back of my mind uh, around the sort of museum and the archives. Are the archives available for people to search, uh, even if online, to research their own rings of bells? Um, yes, what what we 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 will provide an inquiry service uh, because it, it's actually easier by and large. Uh, but yes, we we do uh, we do welcome people to come and have a look. It's it's by appointment. Whether things will change in the longer term, um, when the museum and archive developments are, are over, we can't say. Um, but uh, we we since the present company has been in charge and now the trust's in charge, there's very much a commitment to to making the material accessible. Um, there's obviously a degree of commercial sensitivity, so some of the more recent papers would, would be shut. But anything historical, um, you know, we're keen to uh, either either help you find by by answering inquiries or by allowing you to come and browse. Super, thank you. Uh, question from Colin again, quite a, quite a specific question. Interested to note the Belgian bells at Aberdeen St Nicholas um, were these before, after, or at the same time as the big Warner Eight? On which the first ah, the, yeah. From? The Warner Eight was destroyed by fire, and um, they decided not to replace them with a ring and to go for Carolyn instead. And uh, Van Ayrshot got the job, and um, they, they were actually quite well regarded at the time. But that regard didn't last very long, and um, they were they, they were eventually recast by Gillets in the early fifties and uh, 1952, 1954, I think. Um, lovely sounding instrument if you get to hear it now. Super, thanks, Chris. Um, Whilst I've got the opportunity, whilst I've got people here, I'm just going to um, sell uh, our next next week's talk, uh, in fact, the next two weeks of talk, uh, particularly for those people who, who are not on the St. Martin's Guild mailing list at the moment. So next Tuesday, not Wednesday, change of dates, so next Tuesday, we're joined by Mark Davis, who's going to talk about the links between bell ringing and maths. Uh, the following Wednesday, he back to a Wednesday, we're normally on Wednesdays, it's just next week's uh, anomaly. Um, we're, so the following Wednesday after that, we're joined by Gordon Breeze, who is going to talk to us about the impact of tower movement on, on bell movement and therefore the impact on, on striking. So if you are interested in either of those talks or interested in our talks in general, um, I have set up a, spe a specific mailing list for the Wednesday night, except next week's Tuesday, but normally the Wednesday night training talks. Uh, so if you're interested, um, I've just put the Gmail account um, in the chat box to so email us. I'll add you to that specific mailing list uh, and then you can hear information about our talks. All our talks are recorded on, on online and also the future programmes online as well. So have a look at our website uh, if you're interested and let me know if you want to join that mailing list. Um, I think unless there are any last minute questions for Chris, in which case, say your piece now. Yes. 
Can I give a plug um, for a talk that Chris Pickford is giving to the Western branch of the Worcesters, which may be of interest to people in the uh, Birmingham area that fringe into Worcestershire in particular. Friday night, the 29th of January, he's going to be giving a talk about um, bells and Worcestershire bells. And I think it's on the diary on Bellboard if people want to find out more details on that one. So uh, within reason, everyone's welcome to that in a similar vein to uh, this one. Super. Th thanks ever so much, Alison. Thanks, Arthur. Cheers. Thanks, Chris. Okay. <laughs> and Marjorie, you've unmuted yourself. Is that yeah. a... Well, Marjorie is my wife. I'm Carl Zimmerman. Uh, oh, hello, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Corresponded for years. Never seen you before. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, unlike most of you chaps over there in England, I got my start in the Carillon side of the Tower Bell world uh, with a Taylor Carillon at uh, Trinity College in Hartford. But the thing I wanted to comment on was your remark about the 10 bells that went to Ames, Iowa. I've known for a long time that those provided the foundation for today's present instrument. And the thing that's really notable about it is that the original 10 bells are still there and each of the three subsequent editions has matched them perfectly. So there've been no replacements along the way. I think that speaks to the quality and the consistency of Taylor's tuning work. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I mean, I, I'd make the same point about, uh, about their ringing bells because, um, really from, from the autumn of 1896 onwards, they were turning out wonderful peels with, with almost complete consistency. Uh, you know, St. Patrick's Dublin, um, Heavy Tree, some, some fabulous peels, and uh, they, they, they're, just good. they're just great. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. That was nice to hear. Super. Um, Chris, you have a, a quite a few thanks coming through in the, the chat box. And uh, you know, I, I want to echo that. When we come out of um, this situation of pub to be open, I owe lots of people uh, a pint of beer, people who come to speak to us. Those <laughs> who have come to do two talks, as you have, Chris, I, I haven't quite Goodbye. decided yet how much you deserve, but Chris has also offered to come and do a third talk for us. So that deserves, I don't quite know what yet, but um, we'll think of something appropriate, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, so hopefully when, when, you know, in a couple of months time, Chris uh, has agreed to come back uh, to talk about the Birmingham Bell Founders in particular, specifically, and, um, you know, we, we will look forward to that talk when it's, uh, when it's written, I think, Chris, is that right? Yeah. Um, but, but thank you, Chris, on behalf of the St. Martin's Guild and, and everyone here tonight um, for that fascinating talk of, of a real breadth of, of tailors and the depth as well, you know, an intimate history, but also their innovative um, past, you know, I think is absolutely fascinating. And uh, I'm sure I speak for everybody here tonight. So thank you again. Nice to see everybody uh, from far away and from, uh, you know, cl close to Birmingham. And uh, we look forward to um, speak, seeing you again soon, Chris. Okay. Good night, all. <laughs> night. Night, all. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right.